not the adults going to work. And it's, it's interesting that they place the, the knowledge on the top oh. and tax rate is kind of, mm -hmm. should go down to work. Exactly. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's so interesting. And uh, so this is kind of, there's, so I put this image here, but so this is just kind of how also schooling is no longer also linked to school itself, both in space and time, right? So it's not only images of children sitting at the desks, uh, raising their hands or reading textbooks, you actually, a lot of learning also happens in textbooks. You can see that a lot of learning is happening outside in the nature, right? And here we can see nature even jumping out of the textbook itself, right? And there is image of, of some fun, the person, is it from a fairy tale? What is it? What is it? Oh, the person? Oh, here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be a Uti, this, which is, yeah, from the fairy tale. Yep. Some men, like, let me a fairy yeah. tale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and so here is this just example of this disruption of the linear time, right? So we can see that there is no more linearity at all. So we can say what we can see is a circular time. So they're actually going back to the kind of pre-modern pagan traditions as well. So when we celebrate the seasons, but we also celebrate summer solstice, we celebrate winter solstice, right? So it's no longer linked to uh, the linear progression of the calendar, right? From, I don't know, 2016, 2017, but it's really based kind of on the cycle of nature and the cycle of life in a way, yeah? And, but what I wanted to say here, which I talked about earlier, that the cycle, so in the Soviet textbook, you see linearity on the one hand, but at the same time, the textbook itself actually were organized by seasons. So you would open the Soviet textbook and it would start with uh, fall, leaves are falling, children are going to school, and uh, then it would go into the winter, and so now children are playing in the snow and they are going skiing and learning to ski, right? But then it moved into the spring and then look, the trees are blooming now and the birds are coming back, right? And then the summer, and look, here we are back to the earth and we are harvesting and the children are participating in the cold cause, whatever, the collective farms and they're picking potatoes together and then, you know, helping the state. But so it's really interesting too how these like almost paradoxical images of linear and circular time so basically coexist together. And then I was thinking at some point that authors that were writing those textbooks must have been incredibly, incredibly creative and probably also major risk taking, right? Because uh, to be able to so kind of seamlessly combine the different conceptions of time and the different conceptions of space, I think is actually fairly radical. Right, and that the Soviet government actually allowed it and maybe didn't see it, or maybe closed their eyes, <laughs> I don't know. But I think it's really fascinating that they kind of coexisted and layered one on top of another. Anyways, so um, that um, is the end. But I guess what I'm trying to, what I was trying to say here was that, um, you know, it's not a very simple kind of linear story, you know, it's not a very simple um, story of moving from Soviet to the post-Soviet, right, and from the socialist to the capitalist, but if you kind of look more deeply, right, and if you kind of also really understand the context within all of these changes occurring, I think you can also see that, um, the, the story is actually much, much more complex, right? And it's not necessarily a linear transition that some of the images and some of the, well, some of the worldviews, even pre-modern and pagan worldviews actually um, survived even through the Soviet period and then kind of reappeared very, very strongly in the post-Soviet space, again, both in, uh, terms of time and also in terms of space. 
And if you look at the textbooks only through the global lens to see the transition from the Soviet to the post-Soviet, I don't think you would have seen it, right? Mm -hmm. I myself have not seen it when I started doing mm -hmm. this research myself, right? And so to me, it was um, you know, really interesting myself to kind of be able to um, realize and be aware that um, there are all these multiple readings that are possible and also kind of realize how um, important it is also to get rid of the global lens and kind of be more attentive to actually what is happening right in front of you, right? And, uh, and kind of the context within which you yourself are within which you live because often we don't look at it as a sort because often we look at it as something that we know inside out is something that is uh, very mundane but i think um, it also could be very very fascinating if we kind of become also kind of the if we study if we don't let other people study us but we kind of study ourselves and we talk on our own behalf about what we, I don't know, experience and what we see. Mm -hmm. Sorry mm -hmm. not to disturb the five more five more than you, just a tiny reminder. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, there's three, but I know Alton and I'll be there also, and so we will we will make our way there. Okay. We, I, I almost I, done. I, yeah, yeah, just, just the chair. We're close. Thank you, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, that's it, but now maybe you can ask any of the questions <laughs> also from <Sure>. her. <laughs> well, uh, I just have a quick uh, question and clarification. So you're mentioning in textbooks and then so seeing the pictures, I was curious if with the textbooks, you mentioned that the ministry approved them, is that used synonymously textbook with children's books? Like in, so in the US we talk about the children's, children's books, <coughs> and anyone can go out and use them or at least just specifically ones that were used within the schools? Uh -huh, yeah, so these ones are specifically used within the schools to okay. teach children to read. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, good question. Yeah, uh, can, you, can you go back to the picture with the uh, <laughs> children going to school? Uh -huh. And the school? Yeah, I love those pictures. This one? Yeah, so uh -huh. it's interesting. Mm -hmm. So we see them on a separate piece of a sheet. Yeah. But if we are looking like children going to the factory, dreaming uh -huh. about the factory, and workers, they should go to the factory, but they're striving to knowledge. So they're not uh -huh. in a circle. That's ah. interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. See, these are two different pictures, aren't they? No, they no, are, but they are the one. They so are they're open like this. Yeah, they are open. Yeah, as a book, they are Yeah, open. so children think about knowledge, yeah. but they're dreaming about factory, dreaming yeah. to be in, in a adult factory. and go to work. Yeah. And then, yeah. or children yeah. as a stage of film, <laughs> yeah, but they're thinking about the book. Maybe in a circle or two, right? <laughs> Well, but anyway, but I wanted to say that actually textbooks as a curriculum are fascinating sources, I think, also yeah. materials too, <laughs> about, I don't know, childhood or nationhood or, and I was actually discussing with some of my colleagues about, you know, why are these images so striking and the texts are even more striking sometimes, right? They're so direct. And, um, and so we were trying to kind of figure out well, also, especially if you place it in the context of your Europeanization, right? And Latvia, which, it, you know, when we, Latvia joined the European Union, it was really pressure to be, to show diversity, commitment to diversity, multiculturalism, and pluralism. You don't see it at all in these textbooks, right? Mm -hmm. But, so my interpretation is also nobody's looking like there are no observers from the outside looking at the early literacy textbooks because they are often dismissed as oh something of political just little children just learning the letter and learning to read right but they are looking very carefully at the civics education textbooks and they're looking very carefully at history right because um, it's assumed that the kind of ideal ideology would be discussed more directly there right and so there are outside reviewers that are looking very carefully at the curriculum to make sure that there are no, you know, any human rights violations so that the history is presented in a correct way, right? Or that particular issues are addressed. But I don't think anybody is looking at textbooks because they are so 
I, I think people, well, like the early literacy textbooks, I think those are usually dismissed as just, oh, mm. there's actually no politics there. And so just to give you examples, so one of my students was doing research on Armenian textbooks, and so there, the textbooks very, again, early literacy textbooks very explicitly actually show Nagorno-Karabakh as part of Armenia mm. on the map. Mm. Like, so actually, even the boundaries are drawn around Nagorno-Karabakh as belonging to Armenia. Mm. And not only that, also Mount Ararat is discussed as being part of Armenia. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so these are the textbooks, right? And the children are reading these textbooks. Early childhood. Yeah. Where can I say mine from? From the very beginning, yeah. So political. What Chantal did was we we talked about John Dugan's emphasis on balance between art and science, right? And and so looking at all these documents, these are all art, and and how important it is for us to think about you know the 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 role that art can play in education. Yeah, this is fascinating. It's so powerful, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But so, but also going back to some of the questions that you have for the class too. So with this, all of this, you know, emphasis on, for example, nature and ruralness that we see here, I think that definitely shows you that schooling goes beyond the school, right? So here we see how schooling is, like, well, education is everywhere, right? How uh, education is so much linked to just being part of space. A very particular space, right? And uh, and that space physically, like literally, cannot be changed, right? So Latvia does have forests and it has particular rivers, right? Or the, the Armenia has like, its own mountains and uh, vineyards, which cannot be really changed, right? Like this kind of geography cannot really be changed, right? And it's interesting how uh, you know that space becomes also education, mm-hmm. kind of where you are located, right, and how you think about yourself. Yeah. I had a student who also did this research on Kazakhstan as well, which is very interesting, mm-hmm. and she actually looked more specifically at the ethnic issues, not the ethnic issues, and how Kazakh children are portrayed um, kind of next mm-hmm. in the, I don't know, Russian or Korean or other. Yeah, I read the- decided to include within the history or not. The last, like Carol talked about Aboriginal education, so just the terms that we use, right, if we're still using Indian, if we're using Aboriginal, the way that affects how we're projecting onto others and then also yeah. then how they interpret, as you're saying, their own, their sense of self, their being, their place, their shame or not, or do you see yourself, as you were mentioning, in the, the images, yeah. right, do I, can I project myself there, or am I seen as an outsider or not included in any imagery? Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, these textbooks are also full of uh, very racist, also text and images, too. And uh, kind of, so, um, so this is, I'm only telling one part of the story, right? Basically, I'm telling you about how the, I guess that pre-modern and modern coexisted in Sumatra.
survived, right? And how that be, being imagined through this textbook. Mm -hmm. But then another part of the story is who is not part of this picture, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, an important story as well. And uh, and so I think already from here you see that not everybody is included, that many people will not be able to see themselves in here. But also, and I'm not sure if that's going back to the, um, well, actually, I can give you, so for example, if, if the story about who is not included, if you read the text, you know, closely. So for example, you can see stories like little stories about child going to bed and the mother telling, basically, just talking with the child about the day and says, well, I hope that you brushed your teeth today because chances are that you were outside and speaking with other people and chances are that you probably um, utter some Russian words during the day. Oh. And if you did that, your mouth must be really dirty right now. And I hope that you wash your mouth. Sleep well with your little child. Oh my god. Uh -huh. So nationalistic. <laughs> yeah. Words like zontik or so it's really yeah. funny, kurka or whatever something. It's so, I mean, it's not funny, right? It's actually really yeah. scary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or Another example, actually, which is really, really interesting too, and, and which also, which actually even made me think about are these textbooks even monitored or looked at by outside by anyone? Was this one of the Latvian textbooks also had an insert where all the letters were written and the pictures were given for each letter, so like a alphabet basically. So it's a little insert that goes inside the book. And all of the objects on the pictures, except for two, were um, non-human objects, right? It could be a tree or a ball or you know a house or the sun, and only two were humans. And one was for the letter uh, I, and that was an Indian, and it was portrayed as uh, basically a naked individual with feathers around and dark. And the other one was with a letter N, and it was also half naked Negro. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. only two humans, and they both were the absolute, basically, outsiders of you were not like stereotyped. <laughs> to yeah, yeah. Were these textbooks in general were they run by? Uh, publishing houses. Oh, they are approved by the ministry. Oh, yeah. Okay. So they are reviewed mm -hmm. by the special mm -hmm. committees. So it's the they same are approved. publishing houses that. No, they are different publishing okay. houses, but the ministry has committees that review the textbooks before they are published, right? And so, and that's why that even by that question came to my mind are they actually reviewed by anybody else outside of Latvia, right? Because they probably should be more carefully reviewed. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so the whole other there is a whole other story to this, and, it, and it's about who's not included into this project of reimagination, right? But this question is also, like I said before, is also absolutely painful because we are talking about here about a nation that is less than two million people by this time, right? that is threatened by not only the European Union and all of this diversity, but also um, all the immigrants that are coming into Latvia right now, including from China, right? And also at the same time, this very strong uh, neighbor, the Russia, mm -hmm. you know, who is still a major, major threat, and especially, you know, after the invasion of Ukraine, right? It should it be from a child to political? Yeah. Who yeah. knows? But it's also a source of imagining a different future, right? Mm -hmm. And a source of kind of trying to see what is possible, um, you know, in the seeming absence of alternatives, right? So this basically shows that there are alternatives that are being generated mm -hmm. on the ground with just maybe need to look more carefully for that, right? Because they are important too. And they can be inspiring and they can be very interesting, but they also can be dangerous, right? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and these Latvian women? You can't really imagine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.